And so since it'll go in deeper, we know it's softer. And we can set all of this up on an index. And we can measure little particles of phase that are microscopically small now and find out wh which material is the hardest. <coughs> and so we have this hardness device that allows us to get some indication of a property of a material, but I haven't told you how it relates to the stress-strain curve. <coughs> Now, actually, there's a hardness test that I didn't tell you about here that I can ju I'll just describe for you. And it's done by dropping a diamond ball or a tup onto the metal. And the diamond ball hits the metal and bounces back. And we tell from how high it bounces back something about the hardness of the material. If you examined it with a microscope, with a stereoptic microscope, you'd find out that tiny little diamond would have made a tiny little impression in the material. That is, it plastically deformed it a little bit but it elastically deformed it up to the elastic limit before it could plastically deform it. And in that, you get an elastic restitution. That is to say, you get an unloading wave, and that bounces the little ball back up. So what it really measures is, this is called a shore scope test. And what the shore scope test really does for you is to measure the modulus of resilience of the material, in essence. Whereas in the penetration hardness test, like the Burnell and the Rockwell and the, the Vickers uh, those type of tests, we are pushing a ball into the material and you're causing the material to elastically flow and then plastically flow a considerable amount. So we are measuring something that has to do with the strain hardening exponent, that is how hard it will get, what the ultimate strength of the material is and what the modulus of elast uh, elasticity is. So it measures all of those things. In scratch hardness tests, we are looking at the material where we are studying actually the capability of cutting through a material. Just visualize, if you will, a block of material that we're going to scratch. If the scratch penetrator goes that deep in the material, and if you only consider that top fiber of material, then what we've really done is with the scratch, we've elastically loaded it, plastically loaded it, cut it, separated that little ligament in two, right? It caused it to rupture apart. So it measures everything. Modulus of toughness is what it measures. The abrasion resistance, the energy required to, to wear the material out. You said that, uh, I mean, the hardness obviously depends on the phase, you know, on a microscopic level. How about the crystal phase, like with the aluminum, if you look at, you know, is it anisotropic, the hardness? Yes. Will it measure that? Well, the answer yeah. Is, well, I, mean, let, let, I guess you can by setting it up. Yes, but let me, let me give you a, a, a total answer to the question. The, que the question now is, can you by hardness examine anisotropy? That's what you asked me. <coughs> if you took a single crystal of iron, well, first of all, if you took a handbook, your handbook, and you look up the modulus of elasticity of iron, you'll find out it's 30 million. That's Young's modulus. If you took a single crystal of iron, and you measured its modulus of elasticity in the three principal crystallographic directions, you'd find that the modulus of elasticity will vary from something like 28 million to something like 32 million, depending on the direction. So if you took one crystal of iron, one little crystal, and you shoved a round ball down into it, and took it out and looked at the impression, you'd find that it would be eggy, right? because it would elastically recover more in one direction than another direction. So if you want to look at anisotropy, you can. However, I described it for one little crystal, and we can have something that's called statistical anisotropy, that is all the little crystals in a big bar. Say I had this piece of steel that has crystals in it, maybe 25,000 crystals. Each one can tend to line up line up almost exactly the same way. If they lined up exactly the same way, it would be one crystal, right? But if it's almost, then we say we have a statistical anisotropy. We could also measure that if we did an impression on it. Yield strength occurs at a point where the stress-strain curve becomes no longer linear. Popular methods of hardness testing include Brunel, Rockwell, Vickers, and Noop tests. 
Hardness can be an indication of a steel's tensile strength. Hardness testing can be performed on a macro scale to determine hardness of a group of grains, or on a micro scale to determine hardness in just a single grain. I have to move along with the characterization because there are a lot of other things to look at and a lot of different ways to examine the material. And one of the ways to examine the material <coughs> is to find out what the velocity effect on the material is. And you remember in one of the earlier uh, lectures, I showed you a, a slide in which we uh, found out that the, the point at which the material became brittle varies as a function of grain size. Well, we have to have a way of measuring when it's brittle and when it's ductile or something about it. And for this, we don't use a, a specimen like a tensile specimen as we described before. We use something like a, a Sharpie specimen or a specimen that looks like this uh, notched bar specimen illustrated in the slide. <coughs> and actually, it's a very tiny thing, being only about 10 millimeters on a side, but it has a purposefully placed notch in it. And we impose a load on it uh, at velocities of about 18 feet per second in a pendulum type machine generally. We, we could vary that velocity and we'll get different answers. But what we do is we measure the energy that's stored in that pendulum, the potential energy. We let it strike the specimen, it breaks the specimen, swings through that position and we measure its height on the other side and get its potential energy again, subtract the two and say that's the energy that was absorbed by the specimen. <coughs> now. We have, in this particular case, uh, three-point loading, a uh, load here, a uh, load here, support load, and the impact load play applied on the top. And some people say this isn't a fair test. And so there's another type test. It's a cantilever uh, specimen where the specimen is just grabbed on the bottom. We put a notch at the base like this, and we impact load it from this side, and we have a fracture proceeding from the notch across the specimen. It gives us the same type of information, however. <coughs> now, if we, if we are interested in the kind of information we get from this, it would always turn out to look like this in the next slide. Uh, this is the energy to rupture. And uh, in the base, we have plotted temperature going from uh, zero temperature, or let's say this is in degrees C, so it's a room temperature about right here. And so we find out that as we go below room temperature, the material is brittle. It doesn't require as much energy to fracture it. And if we go above room temperature, actually if we can get up around 50 degrees C, then the material actually has a flat portion out here and it becomes very ductile. It takes a lot of energy to rupture it. And so the temperature at which this occurs is very difficult to pick off. You know, you have a band, but we say it has an approximate temperature and we call this the NDT, the null ductility temperature of the nil ductility temperature, temperature where the ductility is approaching zero. Well, let me see if I can tell you how important this is. I'll, t I'll do it by telling you a true story of a little consulting job I once did for a local uh, power company. <coughs> I, I presume you all know what leg irons are, not the kind that they used to put you in jail with, but uh, this, the things that you have spurs on that you use to climb utility poles, right? It's just a, a steel uh, piece of steel, a steel bar, has a right angle in it that goes under your instep. The whole thing is tied onto your leg, onto your lower leg. And at the bend of that piece of steel, right at the very bend of it, there is a spur that you dig into the telephone pole or the utility pole or the tree or whatever you're trying to climb. You've seen people use these things, certainly, and I don't know whether you paid much attention to them, how much of an aim is or you are there, but when you get to the very top of the, the where you want to work, the practice is, and of course you're supposed to use a safety belt around you as you're climbing, but when you get to the very top, you're supposed to have that safety belt on, and you pick up one leg and drive it with all the force you can into the, into the tree. That's to sink that spur, because you're going to be there a long time working. And then resting on that one, you drive the next leg in as, as hard as you can. Well, people are not always safety-minded. And, and so this particular power company uh, had some men that would get up to the top of the pole. And as they went to bang this one 
spur in a tree with all that force it just snapped off and it didn't have the safety belt buckled so it fell off the tree and were injured and that happened once and they thought well you know in any material you can always have one to go wrong but then it happened again and again and a third time and they decided hey something's wrong so I picked up a nice job as a consultant and they said find out what's wrong well the first thing that I did was to find out if they changed materials if they'd ever had this problem before they'd never had this problem before well did you start buying from a new supplier the answer was yes but we did that last year and uh, we, and we haven't had any problem with it when did you, when did you change changed in May and you haven't had any problem since May no and this is in January of the following year and in Maryland where I live in January it gets pretty cold so the suspect was hey they bought them, they substituted a material that had an ND, uh, uh, nil def, uh, a temperature of nil ductility that was too high. It was above room temperature. And when they got into the fall of the year, when the temperature began to drop, 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 by the time they got to January, they were down on that low energy part of the curve. And so what they really had is they had a material with a transition temperature too high, and so we had to put something in it to make it lower. Think about this the next time you drive your car over a pothole. And you, know, and you wang over that pothole and your axle is being subjected to a tremendous impact load. Well, in California, you don't, might not have to worry, but if you're driving in Massachusetts, you might if the temperature is down around, say, minus 15, right? Fortunately, there's somebody out there thinking about this for us and answering those questions that we looked at in the last chapter. And he's saying, hey, one of the constraints you've got to put on this thing is this vehicle may be used in cold weather and so if it's used in cold weather uh, we better put some material in the steel that will lower its transition temperature and they do and a good thing to put in the steel is nickel and so if we make nickel additions to it we find that we can drop the temperature all the way down into absolute zero approaching absolute zero if we do put enough in I always found it interesting to remember things by looking at old wives tales <clears throat> and there's one old wives tale that says you know the, the wood choppers in Canada actually sit down and put their axe blade between their legs and warm it up before they start to work now would you believe that well based on what I just told you you might believe that right I, I live where it gets kind of cold and I even know better but I use an axe sometimes to drive a steel wedge I'm not supposed to do that I have a maul to do that with I could drive that wedge all summer and never break that axe head, but I set it up in the wintertime and I haul off and hit it, and sure enough, I have about six axe heads around my barn that are all broken just because I'm too stupid to remember that there's an NDT, all right, a nil ductility transition in steel.